Thank you very much, uh, Colin, and um, thanks to everybody for coming out on this evening. It's my first opportunity to, to be here, but I hope certainly not my last. It's a wonderful uh, space, and I'm honored to be able to speak with you today. I'd also like to express my appreciation to Bob Howard, who I think helped uh, bring me along to this event. As a colleague of Bob's at Sydney University, I'm really honored to, to, that he uh, included me in this, this program. I, I am primarily a China uh, expert. I spent the past year actually away from Sydney in China uh, and living there and doing some research and working. And so hopefully, at least some of what I say uh, will draw on, on that personal experience, which I think is always so important to the understanding of international affairs. But first I'll begin with some formal remarks and then look forward to a general discussion. Newspapers, Schopenhauer once remarked, are the second hand of history. Focusing on recent events oftentimes can cause us to lose sight of these broader historical patterns. And I think this is a challenge even in my teaching, I find, for the students. Sometimes can be overwhelmed with the rather easy access we have these days uh, to information in this digital society. Now, the most common historical pattern that all of us, including academics, focus on is, is that of a trajectory. It's a straight line, events even moving upwards or downwards, the rise or fall of a government or the stock market, even the prospects for democracy in the Middle East. What I want to talk about today is another kind of historical pattern, that of a cycle, a circular dynamic where similar events follow one another in a kind of repeated or regular fashion. Now, I believe the attention to these cyclical patterns is often neglected in our studies of the past. So this is a bit of a long-winded introduction to what I want to talk about today, and that is the influence of public opinion upon China's foreign policy towards Japan, and then the broader implications for Chinese politics, and of course for China-Japan relations. So my story here begins on September 10, 2012, when Japanese Prime Minister Nola, Yoshihiko Nola, announced that the Japanese government was going to nationalize the disputed Gyalyu or Senkaku Islands, purchasing them from a private Japanese owner. Now, coming after a summer of rising tensions over the islands, Noda's announcement sparked violent protests across China. Japanese businesses were ransacked, cars smashed, windows broken, restaurants set on fire. Thousands of people were demonstrating in front of the Japanese embassy in Beijing, and I'm sure the events were familiar to many here. The International Crisis Group in Beijing warned that Beijing's eroding control over national sentiment significantly restricts China's future options to dial down the situation. And then the demonstrations came to an abrupt halt. On September 19, traffic flowed calmly in front of the Japanese embassy in Beijing, the site of vociferous protests just the day before. Chinese media publicly praised Japanese society where, quote, People prioritized their personal affairs and remained focused on their own lives. While the diplomatic dispute over the islands was hardly over, this surge of visceral public anger and protest in China had come to an abrupt halt. The dramatic rise and then fall of the 2012 anti-Japan protests in China reveals, I believe, a cyclical pattern, one best understood as a wave of public mobilization. So in the rest of my time this evening, what I want to do is just briefly talk a little bit about this concept of a wave of public mobilization. And I apply this framework to four repeated rounds of anti-Japan protests, ending up eventually in 2012, and then looking a little bit to the future with the implications for both China-Japan relations and for China itself. Now, a wave of public mobilization consists of really three elements, a rapid shift in public opinion and popular emotions, growing political activists or protests, and expanded sensationalist coverage in popular media and on the internet. A wave may begin with a small event, but then like a snowball rolling downhill, it gathers greater force as it picks up speed and mass. Now as nationalist protests swell, they pose a dangerous dilemma for Chinese leaders. If they suppress or ignore the protests, they can be criticized for being soft on foreign policy. But if they tolerate the protests, they can spiral up into a direct challenge to the Communist Party's rule in China itself. Now, faced with this situation, in many cases, Chinese leaders often tolerate, even encourage, protests. Why? Well, first off, protests in China can serve as a safety valve. They allow the release of popular anger toward a foreign government, like Japan, that might otherwise be directed back at Beijing. 
The protests can also quickly and rather reliably inform the Communist Party leaders of the strength of attentive public opinion in China, something that's particularly important in a society without regular free and fair elections. Protests also play a very useful role at the negotiating table. They strengthen the leverage of Chinese leaders sitting at the table across from Japan's counterparts because they can say to them, I can't do this deal, my hands are tied because of this public opinion back home. So tolerance increases the sort of effectiveness of that kind of argument. Now as a wave builds, public pressure can influence policy decisions in China. Because they are more likely in Beijing to delay, modify, or even reverse the kinds of policy choices that they think will be very unpopular with people on the streets. But as a wave of public mobilization grows stronger, the leaders' cost-benefit calculations begin to shift. Protests have served their usefulness. Pressure has been released, popular demands appeased in China, and the diplomatic leverage has already been gained. Meanwhile, the costs begin to loom large. Protests risk exacerbating domestic instability. They risk undermining what is often a carefully crafted diplomatic foreign policy. Now at this point, Chinese leaders tend to shift toward demobilization, redirecting public attention, ramping down sensationalist media coverage, and cooling online sentiments, limiting protests in the streets. Now, while effective, these kinds of intensive controls, censorship, are themselves difficult to maintain. At some point, the attention of top leaders in China move on to other issues. And very soon, we might see another unexpected incident explode and another wave of public mobilization emerge again. Now rather seeing these kinds of one-off interactions as having an inevitable ending point, the revival of Communist Party rule, the decline of the Communist Party in China, I believe these really reflect a kind of cyclical dynamic, a fundamental nature of state society relations in China today that are in many ways a key part of the puzzle of explaining of what holds the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, in power today. So now I want to step back a little bit in history, briefly talk about three different instances of anti-Japan protests before coming on to the 2012 incident. We'll begin in the summer of 1985, one of the hottest on record in recent years in Beijing. And amidst a swell of popular unrest and nationalist propaganda that summer in China, on August 15th, Japanese Prime Minister Nakasone Yasuhiro decided to make his first official visit as a prime minister to the Yasukuni Shrine, a temple in downtown Tokyo which honors the souls of Japan's war dead, including 14 Class A criminals. Now the Chinese government initially responded rather calmly to Nakasone's visit, but Chinese students did not. On September 18th, the anniversary of Japan's 1931 invasion of Northeast China, thousands of university students marched to Tiananmen Square shouting slogans like, down with Japanese militarism, down with the second invasion, a, a sort of re reference to Japan's trade surplus with China at the time. And these student protests began to spread to cities around China. Now initially, the Chinese leadership responded calmly until they learned that students were planning broad national demonstrations around the country on December 9th. December 9th is the anniversary of the 1935 protests in China criticizing the then nationalist government, led by Chiang Kai-shek, for being too soft on Japan. And so the Chinese party leaders were desperately worried that once again you'd have students in the streets saying that they are standing up for Chinese interests against Japan. And that is not a situation that they wanted to face. They curtailed the protests strongly, instituting controls at all of the universities across the country. The People's Daily warned ominously, if the youth movement will suffer serious setbacks, the youth of a generation or even several generations will be held back and wasted if this state of unrest continues. <laughs> the protests were soon halted. The Chinese leaders did shift to a slightly more critical diplomatic stance towards Japan, particularly over the trade dispute, but this brought that first wave to an end. A decade later, China saw yet another swell of anti-Japan activism, this time over the contested Diaoyu or Senkaku Islands. The 1996 dispute emerged when a group of Japanese activists sailed to the islands, seeking to renovate a lighthouse and trying to get Japanese government recognition of the lighthouse. The Japanese government defended their actions and protests broke out in Hong Kong. Tens of thousands of people in the streets of Hong Kong 
These protests continued to swell after a Hong Kong activist attempted to jump off a boat and swim to the islands. He was drowned. And this martyrdom really spawned a night, a worldwide round of protests by ethnic Chinese against Japan and over these islands. Now, the Chinese leaders moved very carefully about to resume sovereignty over Hong Kong. They actually wanted to tamper down demonstrations and did not let this spread onto mainland China itself. And then the protest ended, but over the next few years, China moved very cautiously to keep good diplomatic ties with Japan. However, following the 1996 protests, that activism and those protests soon spread into mainland China. And they began to build a movement called Baldiao, or Protect the Daoyu Islands, within China itself. I met and got to know a number of the people involved in this in the course of doing the research for my book. And they told me this story of what the incident I'm just about to describe to you. In March 24th, 2004, when a group of Chinese activists actually landed on the islands themselves and were arrested by the Japanese Coast Guard. This sparked protests and demonstrations back in China, flag burning in front of the Japanese embassy in Beijing. China's vice foreign minister warned Japan, unless the activists were immediately and unconditionally released, quote, the situation will expand and grow more complicated and will certainly arouse the powerful indignation of the Chinese people. So once again, using that public sentiment to gain more negotiating leverage. This combination of protests and diplomatic pressure worked. The activists were soon released by Japan, and China responded by trying to tamper down tensions. Now, this was during the period of Prime Minister Koizumi's uh, leadership in Japan, as many of you will know. Protests from 2000 up to 2005 continued to swell with massive demonstrations in spring 2005 in China, mostly in opposition to Japan's efforts to gain a permanent seat on the UN Security Council. But what people tend to forget is after that protest, Beijing again turned off the spigot. Those protests came to a rapid end, and after Koizumi left office in September 2006, Beijing again moved very quickly to stabilize diplomatic ties with Tokyo. So now finally we come on to the present, to the 2012 protests. Now these began on the morning of April 16th, when Tokyo Governor Isaharu Shintaro informed a rather startled audience, the Heritage Foundation in Washington, D.C., that his city was planning to purchase three privately owned islets in the Senkaku, or the Daoyu chain, from their longtime private owner. Now, following Isaharu's announcement, the ships began to sail. Japanese, Hong Kong, and Taiwanese activists all sent private flotillas attempting to land on the islands to demonstrate their sovereignty claims. Now, the Hong Kong activists were, some of them were arrested for their effort to land on the islands by Japan, and protests again broke out across China. They grew worse, as I mentioned at the opening, after Prime Minister Noda's announcement on September 10th that the Japanese government was planning to nationalize the islands by purchasing them from a private owner. Now, during this time period, I was, of course, living in China, and the, the media and the news websites and the internet were just covered by this sensationalist coverage criticizing Japan. One famous cover of one of the newspapers said in large letters, China says no to the nationalization effort. An online poll received over one million responses in China, urging, quote, military actions towards Japan. A Hong Kong newspaper insisted the Japanese government must directly face the voice of the Chinese people. Now, to many observers, the protests appeared perhaps to be manufactured by the Chinese government. And so I'll describe for you, um, one of the participants in a protest later wrote online about his experience protesting in front of the Japanese embassy in Beijing. He said a plainclothes man came to the front of the protesters and announced in a microphone the following comments. We all know that everyone is very angry, but there are a lot of foreign media up ahead. This is a time to demonstrate the quality of Chinese citizens. Do not carry bottles of water or anything like that. Remember to sing the national anthem. Everyone must take part in chanting slogans. Facial expressions are to be kept serious. Don't laugh when you shouldn't be laughing. And something I'd like to reiterate to my own students, don't play with your cell phones. <laughs> now, despite the Chinese government's efforts to keep things under control, in fact, protests soon began to spiral out of control. A few of the placards in the demonstrations bore large portraits of Mao Zedong, clearly an implicit criticism of the leadership as inadequately nationalistic. A protester in Shenzhen was heard on television shouting, down with communism. Violence 
also began to spread. The most chilling incident occurred on September 15th in Xi'an, in northern China, when one man driving with his wife in a Japanese-made car was attacked by a mob in the midst of an anti-Japan protest in the streets. They pulled him out of the car and hit him repeatedly over the head with an iron bar. He was hospitalized, his skull smashed, and his speaking ability severely impaired. As the sensitive September 18th anniversary approached, the government's controls over the protest grew stronger. The official media published calls for level-headedness. They urged sensible patriotism. Local officials were issued um, closed-door orders not to, quote, participate in, encourage, or publicize anti-Japan protests, and to instruct residents to act legally and rationally to express their patriotic spirit. Urban residents in Beijing and Shenzhen and elsewhere received text messages, SMS, on their cell phones, urging them to stay away from protests and to, quote, remain calm. China's Global Times newspaper, the vanguard of nationalist sentiment in China, published a warning ominously urging that protesters, quote, should not turn to the dark side. And indeed, the day after September 18th, on September 19th, the street protest came to an abrupt halt. The public's attention soon moved on to other issues. Now, while the diplomatic tussle and the security tensions continue today in a very dangerous fashion, this surge of anti-Japan activism in China once again had come to an end. Now, while this rise and fall of the 2012 protests was rather familiar, one new element did emerge, um, a consumer boycott of Japanese goods supported by the government. Now, consumer boycotts of Japanese goods carry powerful historical echoes in China. The patriotic movement of the 1930s was led by Chinese youth protests boycotting Japan's invasion through resisting buying Japanese consumer goods. There were sporadic calls for consumer boycotts in each of the protests, which I mentioned earlier, but nothing as widespread as in 2012. Now, this was spread primarily from a grassroots effort, spread online and via text messages, urging Chinese consumers to not buy Japanese brand consumer goods, particularly electronics and cars, and to not visit Japan. Now, some Chinese experts publicly criticized the boycotts as irrational, but in the most cases, in my experience, and seeing this firsthand, there really was a broad base of support among the public and among most experts. Uh, I used to go shopping across the street where I lived in Dalian, in northeastern China. My local noodle shop had a big running sign, protect the Diaoyu Islands, don't buy Japanese goods. Cars all throughout China were covered with stickers, and many times people put the boycott Japanese sticker goods right over the label of their Nissan or Toyota, <laughs> in case anybody was confused. So they knew where their loyalties lie. So it was pragmatic, if nothing else, the Chinese are. But nonetheless, uh, this was a serious, emotional, bottom-up effort more than anything else. But what I found particularly interesting is the way in which it was paralleled by a top-down effort supported by the Chinese government. And this is new. So Chinese customs authorities began tightening their inspections of seaborne imports from Japan. They delayed the approvals for visas for Japanese employees working within China. Japanese firms were asked to withdraw from international trade fair in Chengdu, and Chinese tourists were officially warned not to visit Japan because of the dangers to their safety. Um, and in fact, these soon began to affect Japanese companies within China. Japanese car companies in particular, the manufacturers, saw dramatic drops in their sales to China, one of their largest markets in the world. And in fact, due largely to the tensions with China, J.P. Morgan downgraded its projections for the Japanese economy for the final quarter of 2012 from an admittedly unexciting 0% growth to actually a shrinkage of 0.8%. Now, while China's actions clearly risk deterring their own foreign investment, undermining their domestic manufacturing, and tarnishing Beijing's carefully varnished global image, it seems clear that Chinese leaders and consumers were well prepared to pay the price. So I want to just conclude here by briefly suggesting two broader implications that I think come out of this, uh, this argument, and then I'm happy to, to discuss more recent events with you. But first, for China-Japan relations, I think this history suggests that public pressure alone is unlikely in China to swell out of control, to force Chinese leaders down a road of military conflict with Japan that they would not otherwise go down. 
Now, this is not to suggest that diplomatic or security relations will be all smooth sailing, or even that conflict is, in fact, not possible. Indeed, tensions over the islands today continue to smolder. The situation remains extremely dangerous, and particularly, from my perspective, is the risk of an accident, an unintended event from either side, planes or boats bumping into each other uh, in a way that can quickly spiral out of control and both where political leaders on both sides feel themselves trapped into this dangerous dynamic where along the line of the, the Collins initial quote suggested, we end up in a war that nobody planned and certainly nobody wants. For this reason, it's extremely important that political leaders on both sides take steps to de-escalate the situation, to begin to walk us backwards from the dangerous precipice where we find ourselves today. More broadly, I think, this pattern of state society interactions really does provide some insight into what is, I believe, the central question for Chinese politics. And that is, how does the world's largest and most powerful communist party dedicated to constructing a harmonious society actually maintain its authority over a society rife with tension and contention. In fact, I think by selective tolerance of these popular protests, contentious policy debates, Chinese leaders actually find, provide a kind of outlet for the most mobilized, informed, and engaged segments of their population so they can express their opinions. At the same time, the state relies upon pervasive surveillance, coercion, and censorship to restrain activists from mobilizing a broader segment of the public to directly challenge CCP rule. The result is a kind of contained contention, which popular protests continue to erupt, but do not fundamentally undermine the party state's authority. So by combining a kind of tolerance and responsiveness with persuasion and repression, the Communist Party in China has developed a system of what we might call responsive authoritarianism. And this, I believe, more than anything else, has helped it maintain political power amidst an era of social and economic transformation in China. So I'll stop there, and I'll really look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you. Mm, yeah, well. I'll just uh, pull up my crystal ball and. Uh, <laughs> and uh, um, yeah, I, it's very. It's, that's the that's the key question, Colin. That's absolutely the, the the most important element here is that political leaders have to deal with these hard questions. What's the possibility and what's the path uh, to some kind of um, denouement, at least some reduction in tensions, if not a full resolution? Um, I, I I think two parts to that answer. First, I think the history, as I suggested here does offer some room for optimism. I would suggest that, in fact, we've seen them again and again walk to a very dangerous precipice and move back. So to that extent, I'm a bit of an optimist and an outlier in that regard. Uh, but it's certainly uh, not for certain. As far as the path that might, uh, might work, I'd imagine it's something along the lines of, of first a meeting between political leaders, so some kind of third party forum or an opportunity to have a handshake to develop a sort of initial sort of break in the tension we have right now. We've seen some low-level envoys going back and forth between mostly from Japan to China. Hopefully the next step is some kind of meeting between the leaders. And then once we sort of break this freeze in relations, uh, the most reliable and sort of reasonable step forward would be some kind of agreement on notification. They've had various maritime notification agreements where they just agree to let each other know where they're going. These are nice because they don't necessarily have to touch on sovereignty claims. So we don't have to say whose territory we're moving into. I'm just letting you know I'm going there. Uh, and, and so this is sort of a nice face-saving device that may in fact enable us to sort of move back off that precipice. Of course, I, I, from my perspective, uh, Prime Minister Abe's recent uh, comments in regards to both the Japanese constitution and history issues uh, don't don't move us down that path, and they're going to make a lot of folks angry in Beijing. So clearly, de-escalating at home is going to be a crucial first step. I'll say a word about that, which is um, very much not a, a Japan expert, uh, but I think from the point of view of China and from the relationship, my sense is that the sort of the longer, mid-term factor changing this 
dynamic is really on the Japanese side. For the most part, the shifts are coming from Japan. Folks like Abe represent, I think, a very powerful force within Japan, which is, I think, deeply dissatisfied with some elements of that post-war consensus led by the LDP, and would like to really question the nature of the, the pacifist constitution in Article 9, would like to have a more positive national identity and self-image on the world stage. And they're really looking for that space. The challenge for Beijing will be how do they live with a very different kind of Japan. How do you live with a Japan which says, we have a military, we're gonna be more proactive on world affairs. Uh, and, and that, I think we haven't gotten there yet. I think there's a lot of concern in China about how they live with this new status quo. So I think that really, the changes in Japan are really underestimated by a lot of observers, but that's where our attention needs to be as much as anywhere. Right. Well, you're, right. you're absolutely right, sir. Um, the China's claim runs through Taipei. Uh, the Chinese claim is that these islands form part of Taiwan. And of course, as we all know, <coughs> Taiwan is part of China. And so, <laughs> and so therefore, the uh, Taiwan Islands belong naturally to China. Um, no, you're absolutely correct. And one of the really interesting <laughs> dynamics of this last round of disputes in 2012, we're dealing, of course, with a very different Beijing-Taipei relationship in the last few years that we've had for a long time. Deep economic integration between the two sides, a real reduction in a lot of the tensions, and, and folks still anxious about that in different places, but nonetheless, it's being transformed. Uh, and so we, we didn't see cooperation over the islands on this time, but there certainly was a lot of attention in China to what Taiwan was doing over the islands. And so this is becoming much more of a, at least a triangular dynamic in the future where Taiwan is gonna be a very important player going forward. Now from their side, the Japanese were trying to reach out to Taiwan to divide and conquer. We will find some agreement with Taiwan, which is much more reasonable as a way to sort of isolate China. And of course, Beijing was not very happy with that strategy. So this is a very complex triangle going forward. You're absolutely right to, to highlight. Yeah, I mean, I'm not so familiar with that particular proposal, but certainly there, you point to a couple of key dynamics. It's the Chinese long-standing concern of being surrounded and trying to be contained by power certainly fuels some of these fears. And there has been a lot of criticism in some quarters in Beijing um, of the Obama's sort of pivot uh, back to Asia, the Obama's effort to sort of uh, re-strengthen ties with countries rather conveniently placed around the periphery of China have raised a lot of concerns from folks in Beijing when they look out at the map uh, and, and have a set of very serious security concerns about, about their position in the region as well. Uh, so do these feed into each other? I certainly hope not, uh, but it's very likely. Uh, to the extent that countries see China as acting in an aggressive fashion, uh, it encourages these kinds of dynamics. And the South China Sea in the last year or two is a clear case in point. Uh, the step question really has to be about how you step back from these kinds of dynamics. And I think part of the answer must be with avoiding giving any cause for those kinds of fears in China. I, I personally would not support any effort like that. I don't think it'd be in the interest of a country like Australia, for example, because you have to deal with China. Any look at the map tells us right away that any agreement towards a stable regional security framework going forward must have some kind of integration and involvement with China. It just cannot work any other way. Well, um, in my, um, where I used to go every day to buy bread and noodles and such in Dalian, there was, after this incident emerged, a big sign-up board on the market where we walked past, where you could, um, if you believe that the Diyaliwan has belonged to China, sign your name here and add your appropriate comment on what you think of the Japanese people. And those are pretty colorful uh, uh, remarks. And, and so it was interesting for me to walk by and read that every day or two. But after about a week or so, a new section emerged on the sign on board. And that was boycott American dollars. And it was a big picture of, of Uncle Sam, the American sort of represent there with the hat. And he was holding hands with, with Japan and trying to circle around China. So it was amazing and surprising to me as, as an American. Uh, to find myself in, the, in this basket you know, uh, in my local market. So I think, I think you're right that, that for a lot of sort of folks on the street kind of thing, popular sentiment, and even at the very highest levels in China, uh, there was a, a belief that this was kind of like that containment strategy. This was Japan and the United States working together to keep China down. 
And it does feed a kind of distrust, uh, feeds a very dangerous cycle where, where it becomes harder and harder to back down or reach some kind of uh, agreement over even these islands in the short term. So, so I think that you're right to point to that, and that's just um, a dynamic that forces folks in Washington to tread very carefully on how they manage both of these very important relationships. And, and that is, of course, equally true for Australia. Right, so Australia has a critically important relationship with Japan, long-standing and very important economic relationship with Japan, uh, close political ties, and, and a lot of sort of trust between the two countries that is important to maintain. At the same time, I, I just, as I mentioned, I just recently edited a book on Australia-China relations as we're marking the 40th years of this ties. And there's no question uh, that in terms of economic ties going forward and today, China it is an essential part of prosperity for this country. And that the Australian people and the prosperity in this wonderfully wealthy city we all live in now uh, is very much interdependent upon what happens in China. And, and so in managing that relationship with Japan, uh, Prime Minister Gillard and others, of course, have to keep an eye on the Chinese ball. Thank you a lot, Justin. And uh, uh, Justin, of course, has a, has a new book out on humor, so I, <laughs> I hope that one's in there. <laughs> um, yeah, I, uh, are they, are they, well, they're busy, you know, can I say? <laughs> Folks in Beijing, I wouldn't want their job. Um, certainly, obviously, domestic issues and economic ones in particular must be uppermost in the mind of Chinese leaders. Uh, one of the um, fantastic opportunities I had this past year uh, was to do a lot of traveling within China. So along with my family, uh, we traveled extensively in northeastern, far northwestern, and then far southwestern China on the border areas where very few people were Han Chinese or spoke Chinese at all, for that matter. And it really reminded me of the incredible diversity and the scale that really is this empire, which at a moment turned into a nation state in the end of the Qing Dynasty. So the, the complexity and the challenges of just hanging on to what they have uh, within China itself, uh, not regarding uh, Paris claim by China, uh, is of great difficulty. And in keeping this all moving forward and in keeping the economic growth happening is such a tremendous challenge. But I, th I think it's in fact quite right, but Linda's certainly right, that um, domestic concerns must be uppermost in Chinese leaders' minds at all points. What that means then for folks in Australia interacting with China, uh, at least if one of the lessons uh, must be a little bit of sensitivity or attentiveness to that concern. That, that when you're dealing with Chinese leaders at the highest level, they will have these set of concerns which would be very alien to folks like us here in Australia or even in the United States. Just holding the country together is of such a tremendous challenge uh, that in many times there may be limits to what they can do or say or implement uh, because of those kinds of domestic governance issues. So that, that's really important, I think, for all of us to keep in mind as we watch China act on the global stage. Should I, when I get back? <laughs> yeah, Washington. Uh, they're, they're, in many cases, certainly the 800-pound gorilla in this room. Uh, the United States plays a tremendously important role, often a, a silent one, as they're not easily observed, in the security architecture, and in fact maintaining security throughout the Asia-Pacific region. Folks in Australia are extremely aware of that, and actually people in China are as well. So, so China's security relationship, particularly the plan, the People's Liberation Army and Navy, um, relationship with the U.S. is this sort of mixed bag. Uh, certainly, I think at one point there is a recognition that China's growth and prosperity has happened under the U.S. Imperium in many ways. It has been the ability to traverse sea lanes of communications peacefully and securely, for example, which have really overseen the growth of China's trading empire uh, and, and its trade ties throughout the world. So there's an element, I think, of, of sort of appreciation for some of that within some elements of the Chinese security apparatus. Uh, that said, China is becoming richer, more wealthy, more powerful, more influential. They will want and in fact will achieve a greater place on the world stage and particularly in regional security affairs. So that is, I think, to be expected. It's not a moral judgment. It ought or it ought not to happen. It will happen. Guaranteed. China will have a much greater place 
in shaping regional security affairs for sure. Now the question is, how do the folks who are already there live with that? And, and that in particular is the United States Navy and its allies in the region. And here I think Hugh White over at ANU is on to something very important about the way in which these two countries are going to have to find a way to live with each other in the region. Now, I actually, not just because of my accent, I actually think the U.S. has done a pretty decent job so far in managing this. We have seen a rise of a great power in world history in China's rise over the last few decades, and it has happened peacefully. The lion's share of, of praise certainly goes to the peoples of Beijing, but people in Washington and elsewhere deserve a little credit for the way in which they've responded to that rise. So I think we have a good deal of success to look back on and maybe a few lessons to learn about accommodation and about reading, uh, reaching a sort of modus vivendi over <laughs> these kinds of issues. And, and finally, I guess I'll say, I think it's useful particularly to look at a few of the key flashpoints. We've talked a lot about the Diyu and Sakaku Islands. The South China Sea certainly have been very difficult to manage. But a more optimistic position is actually in regards to Taiwan. So we were in very dangerous positions over the last decade or two with regards to conflict over Taiwan. And right now, at least, it seems that military conflict between the mainland and, and Taiwan itself is far less likely. Economic ties have really driven that relationship to a different place. Regardless of how folks feel about Taiwanese independence, uh, the possibility for military conflict and from the interests of the United States or Australia is far less than it was a decade or so ago. So there are some bright spots in that region. Right, well, I think um, certainly the, the first point about the history issues, I think uh, the, the broad base of sort of popular sentiment in China with regards to Japan and particularly over the history issues is extremely powerful. That's always brought home to me when I'm, when I'm back in China and we start to talk about Japan. I lived in uh, Dalian, which was um, colonized by Japan for 40 years and is one of the few places that sort of would, you'd expect to have more positive attitudes towards Japan, and even, although we don't have anti-Japan protests there, even in Dalian, the broad base of, of anger it is still there. It's very much tied up with the education and the propaganda of the government, reflecting, of course, on real-world events, tragic and terrible, um, over half a century ago. So certainly that is a, a base of reality that the Chinese government operates in. And like any government, they do it to their own best interest. So they will use that sentiment in different ways to either strengthen legitimacy, to gain negotiating leverage, uh, to in fact misdirect public attention at some points. It's no more than you'd expect from any other government seeking to advance their own national interests. Uh, so I certainly think that they act strategically at different points, and I mentioned some of those in my formal comments. Uh, that said, they, didn't, they can't just totally manipulate this. These sentiments are real and they exist. And the, and the other point about this is many times when these incidents emerge, as I sort of in the stories I told you today, uh, they weren't created by Beijing. Beijing didn't send, didn't tell Japan to nationalize the islands. Beijing didn't send Hong Kong activists off there to learn to land on the islands. They didn't tell the Japanese activists in 1996 to build a lighthouse. So these are more responses by Beijing, acting strategically in its own best interest, uh, and certainly trying to shape public opinion as best as they possibly can. But they haven't, as far as we've seen so far, initiated any of the incidents that I spoke about today. All of those incidents, spark, came from outside of the control of Chinese leaders. And I think that's an important point to keep in mind. 